Hello there and welcome. My name is Nicola Bradbear and I'm here in the Library of Bees for Development in Monmouth in South Wales. We're an international not-for-profit working with bees and beekeepers all around the financially poorest parts of the world. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. Today we're focusing again, this is the third webinar in the series on international trade in beeswax and specifically in African beeswax, which is some of the very cleanest and very best beeswax available on the world market. Um, but before I go any further, I would like to introduce you to our Bees for Development team. So who have we got here today? Sean? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Lawson and I work for Bees for Development. I'm a project manager and I do the majority of my work uh, in Uganda, although obviously at the moment I'm working from home uh, and it's good to be with you this afternoon. Great, thanks Sean. And we have Milan. Good afternoon or good day, wherever you are. My name is Milan. I'm a project manager as well of, for Beast for Development. Um, and I'm mainly working in Ethiopia, WIC Ethiopia, our partner organization in Ethiopia, Beast for Development Ethiopia. Um, and uh, yes, also working from home as a lot of people. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you, Milan and uh, Giacomo here in the building with me. Yeah, I'm Giacomo, yes, I'm in the headquarters, project manager for Ghana and course director in the UK. Thanks, Giacomo. And Janet, where's Janet? Hello, uh, my name is Janet. I'm uh, working from home today. I'm based in uh, uh, South Wales in the UK, and I'm the program manager for Bees for Development. And uh, welcome everybody to this webinar today. Thanks, Janet. Now, I would like to introduce you to our three guest panelists joining us today. All of our uh, panelists are beeswax experts and concerned with large scale beeswax trade. We're talking uh, tons of beeswax, not kilograms of beeswax. So first of all, I'm delighted to introduce you to a highly innovative beeswax trader from Uganda, Mark Rutaro. Welcome, Mark. I'm glad to be here. Great, great. We're delighted that the internet's holding up and you're with us. Fantastic, good. Yes. And uh, okay, so Mark's on the kind of collecting and selling end of the business and on the buying end of the business, I'd like to introduce you to Rob Case Green of British Wax Refiners. It's a very, very long established beeswax refinery. There's, there's very few of those in the world and it's based in Surrey in England, in the UK. Um, and nowadays they also run the East Africa Wax Company, which is based in Nairobi. And I'm sure that Rob will tell us more about that today. So we're delighted to have you with us, Rob. Nice to see you. Thanks, Nicola. Great, that's good. And then the third of our expert guest panelists today is Paul Smith. He's managing director of Thorns Beehives, a very well-known uh, beekeeping equipment business here in the UK that he runs along with Jill and their daughter Rebecca and that um, like like Rob's business uh, Thorns is also a fourth generation <laughs> company so long established they're based in Lincolnshire on the other side of of this island um, so hello Paul where are you I'm here. I'm here there you are great I'm here yes yes I'm great. glad to be here glad to be here looking forward to it Super. Well, I should explain that Paul's quite a familiar face here at Bees for Development because Paul also um, is part of our Bees for Development uh, family, really. He chairs the trust and over many, many years, Thorns have supported Bees for Development in all sorts of good ways. So I have to take this chance to thank you for that, Paul. But you're here in your business capacity today, talking about beeswax. So um, first of all, I'd like to hand over to Giacomo who's just going to explain how this webinar is going to work. Hello, welcome. Um, I hope you're able to see and hear us clearly. If not, we will be uploading this session to YouTube and you can subscribe to our channel. My colleague Milan will post a link in the 
chats. So next to the chat, you should also be able to see the Q&A function, and that's where you should click to ask a question. Uh, when you're asking a question, please add your name and where you're following us from. And questions that are for Bees for Development or general questions will be addressed in text by Sean and Milan throughout the webinar. And if you have a question for one of the panelists in particular, please indicate for who, and we will have, uh, we will finish the session with a question and answer session and put as many of the questions as possible to our panelists. Uh, if you would like to make any comment which does not require an answer, please use the chat and it would be great if you can introduce yourself and, and say hi in there as well. And at the end of the session, um, the screen will ask you to go into a feedback form and we'd be very grateful if you could fill that out and let us know if this was useful, if it ran smoothly and um, if it's an event which you which you enjoyed. Um, so yes, without further delay, let's um, get the discussion going. And I'd like to start asking some questions to Mark, who is joining us from Kampala. Mark is a businessman. Uh, he has a broad range of interests, uh, but we know him and have invited him to talk about beeswax. And he's now been trading for over a decade. I believe. And um, yes, it's we're delighted to have you here, Mark. And uh, we understand this has been a particularly tough year in Uganda because as well as COVID, there's been terrible floods and one of the worst locust invasions for a long time. So I guess my first question is, how have these shocks kind of affected your, your beeswax business? Hello, nice uh, to meet you, everyone. Uh, well, I'll be, I don't know, I'll try to summarize. The problems of uh, beeswax export in Uganda started a little bit ahead of uh, COVID uh, because uh, our buyers seem to have changed interest from using beeswax to other materials. So, as an exporter, the problems of beeswax of my business are more of external than what is happening internally. So that's where my brewing comes from. And then uh, the COVID situation also affected the, the logistics. It became more expensive to ship or to find a willing shipping company. And as a result, in uh, 2020, our sales were almost half, 50% of our usual sales in the last five years. So it's been a, a tough year, but we're hoping for resumption of business this year. That is tough. How, um, what alternatives have your buyers shifted towards that you mentioned? What are they using instead of beeswax now? Uh, well, they have talked about uh, sheer butter because uh, Beeswax tends to share the same functionality with uh, other oils, uh, especially like bases in uh, in, uh, pharma in pharmaceutical and uh, cosmetics. and cosmetics. Mm. So the cosmetics industry is more like a fashion industry. So they tend to to shift trends, and they seem to have shifted trends in 2019 and 2020, and preferred other things like uh, shea butter to beeswax. So the buyer who is a processor, a refiner, found themselves with uh, with too much bees unused beeswax from 2018. And therefore they could not buy so much in 2019 and 2020. That's tough. Yes. Um, Okay, but it's it's good you're still able to uh, to sell some um, that is it hasn't completely dried up. What have been one of the questions that we were thinking is what have been some of the uh, unnegotiable requirements that buyers have when they seek to get beeswax from you, and what instead is there a scope for negotiation on? Uh, the negotiable terms are usually quality. Quality is very important. 
and 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 uh, terms of payment. All the buyers that we have managed to trade with uh, stuck or rigged on LC on LC on and delivery. So. And that's a big problem because for us as traders, we have to buy cash from the farmers, mm. uh, which is usually ahead of the season. So you commit so much money. And if the buyer does not commit to, and the buyer is not committing until you have stock. So if the buyer is not buying, you're stuck with a lot of beeswax and your money is stuck in the warehouse. So that's a big challenge. So we've been trying to password our buyers to maybe prepay either 100 percent or maybe 50 percent but that has not been possible in the last 10 years so that's a, a very serious challenge for us and could you quickly explain what is uh, an lc it's a letter of credit i believe how does it work it's a letter of credit okay well the process of uh, export involves uh, initially uh, uh, a non committal negotiation where you agree on prices and quality. And then after that, you do what they call a pre shipment sample. And you send a sample to the buyer who tests to see whether the quality is what they expect. Mm -hmm. When that is approved, then you they give you what they call a purchase order, which is basically the supply contract. And in the supply contract, that's when you specify, that's when you, they commit the price and then you also specify terms of payment. So there are two, in the other export businesses, there are two types, there are two main ways that uh, international business is paid for. So sometimes there's prepay where the buyer sends you money in advance, which is the most favored uh, uh, trading uh, model because you get to, to use some of your money and also the buyer's money because you're partners. But in this case, the beeswax buyers only insist on LC at site. That means that I must uh, use my own money from to purchase the works, to stuff the container and, and, and transport it from Uganda to, to Mombasa so that I can get, uh, so that I can get a bill of lading. And once I have a bill of lading, I submit it to the bank together with the LC and I get paid. This is a big challenge because the costs of the business are such that uh, there's a purchase part of the works from the farmers, which you have to pay in cash. And then there's a transport bill from Uganda to Mombasa and the time from Uganda to Mombasa and the time between purchase from the farmer up to delivery to Mombasa. Purchase from the farmer begins at the beginning of a season, of a harvest season, and that could take about uh, two months. And uh, works from Momba from Kampala to Mombasa may take about three weeks. So you have about three months of committing funds without any recovery or any position of recovery until you have a bill of lading from the shipping agent, which then opens for your LC to be to pay you. So it's a it's quite, quite a difficult business, yes. Yes, and how much beeswax makes it worthwhile to go through all of this? Oh, uh, probably minimum, according to the cost, minimum five tons uh, for container, and uh, that is very low. That is uh, extremely very low, because a, a maximum load for a container is about twenty tons. And if the container has five tons or has 20 tons, it's the same cost for transportation and handling. And you mentioned about quality. What process do you have in place to uh, give buyers confidence that the wax you're providing is what they need? Well, first uh, you, you do a pre-shipment sample and therefore you send a sample to the buyer in advance a small sample, probably 500 grams, which is a free sample. You send it by DHL, which is also very cool. Any DHL is the most efficient and the fastest, and they test. 
So once they establish that this the, the, the quarks meets the parameters they're looking for in terms of the quality, then you have a go ahead. And then from our side, in order to control quality, we decided that uh, we would not buy, we shifted from buying beeswax from the small farmer to buying uh, the entire comb. So you buy the entire comb and then the people in the honey business will extract the honey and then you have a comb to extract the wax. That's the only way you could control the kind of quality that comes in the whole chain. Mm -hmm. If you leave, initially what we were doing, we were buying beeswax from this farmer. And as Rob said, some farmers burn the wax. Some farmers have uh, tree leaves and, and other foreign materials like stones in the wax. I don't know how it comes in. So in order to control the quality, we decided to go for the complete comb before the, before the honey is extracted. I see. Yes. And my understanding is that at present, you, your business is only exporting raw beeswax, right? Yes. Uh, do you see any possibility for uh, further kind of refinement and value addition within Uganda itself? Um, and if so, under what conditions do you think that value might be retained um, in country as opposed to externalized? It's a very, I've uh, been researching about that and it's, it's, it's a very, it's an uphill task. We internally, we have a potential market for refined, for refined wax because we have uh, pharmaceutical companies, not so many in this region. We also have uh, cosmetic companies, but the cosmetic companies consume unrefined beeswax because, yeah, because that's the kind of grade that they have no problem with that kind of uh, of grade. But the pharmaceutical companies need extra refinement and, and processing, for instance, for for coating agents. Uh, that kind of technology is is not very available. So you need to get it from, I think it's proprietary. So unless we have uh, strong partners who can give us technology transfer, then it's going to be a, a very difficult task to, to achieve. So well, I see a potential for the refined and, and processed works, but we have uh, a technology problem as well to deal with, Same. yes. That's very interesting. So I think that's it for my questions. If there are no questions coming from the other panelists, then we can move on and then we'll um, get back to Mark uh, in the final question and answer session. Oh, good. So Janet, on to you. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Giacomo. Great. So I'd like now to uh, introduce our uh, second guest panelist, uh, Rob K. Screen. So um, Rob is joining us from uh, Red Hill near London. He's the managing director of British Wax, a family run business which was founded uh, uh, in 1914. Yeah. Uh, British Wax is, uh, I hope I got that right. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, British Wax is the only beeswax refining plant uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom and specializes in sourcing uh, natural waxes and preparing them for uh, use in a wide range of end uses, uh, industrial manufacturing processes. Mm. Rob is also co-founder of the East Africa Wax Company, which is based in Kenya, along with Jackson uh, Masesi. So, hello, Rob. Uh, welcome. Hi, Janet. To our webinar, uh, and how? And how, I hope you're well. Yeah, very well, thanks. And you? Great. So, I think maybe the, the first question we wanted to to test you with is: Can you tell us um, you refine and uh, beeswax and prepare different blends for different end uses? Uh, what is the largest end use by volume of the beeswax? Of, beeswax? Um, of the wax that, that we deal with, the largest by quite a long way is personal care, health and beauty. So that 
that's about just over half of all of our production goes into um, whether it's things like lip balms or creams or depilatories, all those kinds of products. Um, then the rest is split between a number of different things. Um, well, beekeeping, which uh, Paul will, I'm sure, tell us more about, but um, also surface coatings like polishes, um, food industry. So it is a, a food additive, um, but particularly there's uh, been quite a, particularly in the UK and in Europe, there's been quite a rise in use of beeswax wraps uh, instead of um, uh, cling film. Um, candles make up a small part and also industrial uses, casting, and uh, there's just a whole variety of different uses there as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rob. And what aspects of the business, uh, whether it's trade processing, um, product development, um, are you investing in at the moment? Um, well, British Wax in the UK, we are particularly, well, the, the market is, is focusing on sustainability in general. Um, so we've got an, quite a number of projects where we're substituting current formulations which are based on paraffin wax and petroleum based waxes and reformulating them with sustainable plant and beeswax. So um, yeah, it's, it's quite challenging, but for example, um, we have a, a wax that's for sealing bottles and that's um, about half of it is from uh, crude oil and what we're doing is we're substituting those waxes and other materials with sustainable ones and creating a, a sustainable bottle wax. So it's those, those kinds of things are, are really where our efforts are at the moment. Um, the East Africa Wax Company we're, is uh, another aspect of that, but I'm sure we'll get onto that. Uh, well, why don't you tell us about it? How, how um, uh, what, what prompted your decision to invest in the East Africa Wax Company and why East um, Africa and not somewhere else? Well, personally, I've been interested in fair trade and ethical trade for uh, a long time. I, I started a, a fair trade furniture business about 25 years ago. Um, wasn't successful, but... Um, it was, you know, the, the desire there is to, to work with um, people in developing countries to, to be able to, to make a more balanced and fair business. Um, this, the British Wax Refining Company is a, my family business. Um, so when I, I became managing director in 2015, I wanted to, to bring that desire for just a fairer balance um, of, of trade into the beeswax business. So um, yeah, we, we are, were buying beeswax from uh, Jackson Masesi in Kenya. And just as Jackson and I um, just discussed business we we found we had a, a lot in common and I could see an opportunity to to work a lot closer with them and um, it was Kenya because that's where Jackson's based. Great, um, yeah. great. Thank you uh, Rob. Um, I've got probably some more questions about the East Africa Wax Company, but before we come to that, uh, you you mentioned something um, just before we the webinar started about the difference between uh, Africa that you've sourced from West, sorry, beeswax that you've sourced from West Africa and East Africa. Do you over the years? Uh, do you see a difference? If so, oh. why why is there a difference? We, we've seen, um, in general, the having bought 
wax from from both sides of the continent we've seen the general trend is that in west africa the wax tends to be darker and have a more uh, a perhaps a richer um, odor and sometimes that is down to it being burnt when it's processed um, in on the eastern side of the continent people tend to use water in in the process of of extracting the beeswax and it tends not to get get burnt so that's that's the the kind of general trend that we've we've seen over the years okay thank you um so you, you've mentioned about your business partner uh jackson based in um in kenya yeah. um in terms so i guess he he's got quite a lot of responsibilities in terms of further um in working with actually the supplier base with working mm. with beekeepers and sourcing uh, the beeswax um, uh, directly. Um, so how has that been put in place, sort of the networks of suppliers, the networks of beekeepers? Has that been a big part of uh, the work of the East Africa Wax Company? That's That's been a fair um, amount of work. Um, uh, actually, the reason Jackson can't join us today is because he's right out in West Pokot, the western region of uh, Kenya that borders on to Uganda, and uh, he just doesn't have a, a good internet connection there. So, um, yeah, I'm representing him as well here. Um, but the the uh, the work of what what we've we had been doing before, and what Jackson had been doing is he had been buying wax from um, aggregators, people who consolidate all the wax together, and um, then shipping it around the world. Um, and he, what he found was that he couldn't always rely on the the quality because he didn't. He knew some of the the people in the supply chain, but he didn't know all of them. And so what we, what we as a business, we've wanted to do is to um, really focus on high quality, very pure beeswax. And in order to do that, we've found we've, we've got to have control of the whole supply chain. And so that goes right back to to knowing individual beekeepers and uh, organizing them into groups or, or encouraging them to organize into to, um, to groups, trading groups. Um, and that's what, yeah, it's, it's, uh, takes a, quite a lot of time. Um, we've got a couple of field officers in Tanzania now um, based in Itigi. So we've, we've tried to, to um, be based just a slightly further away from the main beekeeping um, area and around Tabora because it's, it's so busy there. And so we've got a little bit more uh, control of the supply chain in Itigi and that, those regions. Um, and yeah, we've got the, the um, our field officers, uh, John and Flamina, they will be uh, visiting suppliers, training, um, looking at, at uh, just keeping up contact with them as much as possible. And what Jackson's doing right now is setting up uh, the same kind of thing in, in Western Kenya, in Baringo area and West Pokot. That's, that's a very interesting, Rob. Does that mean so that do you, does East Africa Wax Country uh, Company literally have a list then of your suppliers, each individual yeah. beekeeper? You know their yeah. name, you know where they are. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because we we've we we've gone for organic certification, which also increases the value of the the wax and honey. Um, we've in order to do that you you have to have everyone in 
in a list of suppliers and we've got agreements every beekeeper agrees to to um have certain standards and use certain practices so that so there's no chemicals uh in they don't get introduced in the, the supply chain and uh I mean, some some things might go wrong sometimes. What sort of? <laughs> <laughs> they, they can do, yes. Um, what sort of problems? What I think that I think the one the the biggest challenge for us is to ensure no um, chemicals from things like mosquito and and uh, fly insect control get into the wax. So. Um, permethrin and synthetic pyrethroids, they are the, they are used um, throughout the region in, for example, they're in mosquito nets and quite a number of beekeepers will uh, filter the beeswax through a mosquito net. And we've had to just uh, eliminate all of that, that kind of uh, processing because as soon as uh, the wax goes through a mosquito net, then the chemicals are in the wax and they can't be removed. And uh, you mentioned organic. So mm. is that, um, I mean, organic, you've mentioned it, you know, you've got, you've got to put in all those processes and yeah. you have to have an audit trail and auditors and a certification process. Yeah. Is it worth it? I hope so. <laughs> um, I'll tell you in about 10 years. <laughs> um, as I, I was saying beforehand, um, we, uh, we haven't yet completed equipping our factory in Kenya. So we are using our current system, which is uh, melting the wax in steel drums and it, it comes out. Um, I've got a piece here actually comes out fairly fairly nice and clean but it's not it's not um, perfect at that stage um, so yeah that's that's how we're we're currently doing it we are aiming to have our factory up and running in the next few months and and then we we would hope to be um, really processing the organic beeswax this year, the second half of this year. Great. Good. Well, we wish you uh, the best of luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> and we look forward to hearing uh, the good news when the, uh, uh, the processing plant is up and running. That's really interesting. So yeah. thank you very much, Rob. I don't know if uh, any of our other panelists have a question for Rob, maybe Mark or Paul. Yeah, yes, Rob, um, it's, um, it's Paul. Um, right. The organic um, wax, we have had a few inquiries of late, um, probably in the last 18 months from one or two beekeepers, candle makers as well on, mm. on the supply chain for uh, organic wax. We did look into buying some a couple of years ago, but it was exorbitantly expensive, something like 30 or 40 pounds a kilo. Um, for certified organic wax with a good paper trail. Mm. I mean, if we you know, purchase organic wax from yourselves, I mean, I take it as obviously be a good paper trail to, yeah. absolutely to the source. Um, and, but the price I would think it would be still considerably more than, than good quality African wax as it is now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we, are, we are hoping that that will be the case. Um, our current uh, our current understanding is that organic beeswax is trading at a, uh, like internationally in the, the sort of fifteen to twenty dollars a kilo kind of price, but we don't know. Prices go up and down uh, depending on on availability, supply and demand. So it will be. It's going to be more expensive, but we we don't know right now where that will be in in the second half of this year and next year. At the moment, the challenge is 
uh, availability. Yeah. Very few, very few people have it available. Thanks, Rob. And Mark, I think, did you have a question for Rob? Yes, I want to ask him why. Why is he not coming to Kampala as yet? <laughs> <laughs> we have the best um, beeswax in the region. The best color. I, I think. I think we need to talk. <laughs> um, certainly, you should, we should uh, start talking to to Jackson as well because um, we we do consider ourselves the East African Wax Company. We're based in Kenya, but we we are already <laughs> sourcing from. Tanzania, and we would hope that we can add value to to the beeswax by refining it in Kenya, refining it to um, cosmetic and pharmaceutical and food grade, and be able to export the wax directly to um, end users from Kenya, and not have to deal with multiple middlemen. I understand. That would be great. Look yeah. forward to, to talking to you about uh, beeswax in Uganda. Uh, so what's the current price? Uh, is it a season in, I think it's a season now in Kenya. What's the current price, uh, farm gate? Farm gate. Um, uh, from the farmer. Yeah. I, I, as I understand, currently uh, in Tanzania, we're Paying somewhere around ten thousand to thirteen thousand shillings. Okay. Per kilo. Um, so that going into to dollars, that's five, about five fifty, somewhere around there. So, did you see a price drop in the last one year or two years? We've seen it. Uh, I think it, we saw it drop just in the the last six months or so okay um but this is one of the things is that we're actually going further closer to the the suppliers as well so this is um from from beekeepers okay um yeah it's great rob thank you so much that's really interesting I think at this point, I will now uh, invite our last guest panelist and uh, Nicola um, to have a chat with Paul. Okay, thank you, Janet and Rob. It's very good to see beeswax trade and business <laughs> coming forth. Great. Um, so, Paul, Thorns, yes, you've been going for 108 years. That's a very long time. Yep. And you're the biggest beekeeping equipment manufacturer in the UK and exporting all over the world now, I think, as well. Um, as we understand it, with lockdown and COVID and everything, actually, a lot of people have had more time for their beekeeping than before. So has it been a, a very busy period for you lately? It, it certainly has. Um, as they say, it's an ill wind, um, etc. Yes, last year was probably our busiest year ever, wow. um, mainly due to COVID. Um, it's, to put our finger on it, I think it was a case of a lot of people being furloughed and um, not being able to work um, and maybe not even being able to work from home. Um, and, um, but they were still getting uh, a certain amount of um, their pay and their wages and they couldn't go anywhere um, to spend it. They couldn't go on holiday. They couldn't um, go down the pub, um, couldn't go to the theatre, couldn't go to a restaurant. Um, so a lot, uh, uh, quite an awful lot invested more in, in beekeeping and um, increased their, their colonies of bees, increased their number of hives, um, etc. And we also have a lot of very new beekeepers, people who, who decided to take up beekeeping while they were being um, furloughed. Um, and that has, that has um, um, happened so far this year as well. Um, we've been very, very busy and, you know, we're in the first week of February now and, and um, it's exceeded all expectations as well. So, um, yeah, we've no, we've no complaints. We have, um, we have had some of our own staff who have been furloughed and a few have been shielded, but um, we have actually taken on more staff. So it's okay, good. But that, that's our perception too, that in 
poor countries as well. People have lost their jobs in urban areas and have gone home to rural places. And once again, beekeeping is kind of coming to the rescue as a rural craft that people can do without a lot of startup costs. So it's interesting. It's, it's not just in poor places, but here as well, that people are resorting to beekeeping. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for mental well-being, beekeeping is absolutely fascinating. If you've got the room and the space to, you know, to be able to keep a few hives of bees, obviously not everybody can do that if they're living in flats. Yeah. But it is, it is a very, very good. Um, no, that's right. I think a lot of people sought solace from their bees last year, actually. Absolutely. But... It's, it's, it's the <laughs> ideal um, social distancing hobby. Yes, perfect. And you wear bee suit. We've yeah. seen pictures of lots of beekeepers wearing masks inside veils, which kind of looks a little bit like over the caution yeah. somehow. Anyway, um, back to beeswax, Paul. Can you tell us a little bit about how much, um, you know, how, how much of your business is involved with beeswax? I would think, um, I would think 50%, 40 or 50% wow. is, 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 the, is the beeswax side. We probably process over 100 tonnes a year. Um, a lot of it from from UK beekeepers, UK and Ireland beekeepers. Um, a lot we buy from from um, Rob um, and British Wax, and from uh, other sources. We buy it from Spain and Ukraine. Um, yeah, and from Germany, we bought wax um, various places. Depending on on who makes us a good offer, um, we always try and get a a um, certificate with it. Um, giving us mainly the hydrocarbon content, which I think is quite important to see if it's been adulterated with, with paraffin wax. Occasionally you'll get a certificate that's, that's got a, a full analysis of any chemicals in it, um, like some of the um, um, flumethrin and pyrethroids that Rob was talking about earlier. Um, and once, as, as he did say, um, once they're in the wax, they will not come out. So you have to be quite careful of that. I do know of cases a few years ago of New Zealand beeswax, and New Zealand beeswax um, was and still is in, in many respects some of the best beeswax in the world. But they had a lot of problems with um, paradichlorobenzene in the beeswax, and paradichlorobenzene used to be used for controlling wax moths. And when it comes into contact with beeswax, it gets in the beeswax and it will stay there. Um, and it's very difficult, it, it, it will not come out. So it contaminates all the beeswax foundation that's. Um, the, you know, the factory would be making. So you have to be quite careful of, of contamination. But hydrocarbons is, is the main thing that which we uh, look out for, you know, the right. operation with some um, paraffin wax. So do those traders contact you directly? You're, is yeah. that how it works? Yeah, yeah. And we, we've got a good working relationship with the likes of British Wax Refining, of course, and, and one or two others. But we do get some uh, traders contact, contacting us all the time. From all parts of the world offering us beeswax and sometimes you know you, you take it further but quite often not you don't because you don't really know them um and with brexit now um it's, it's probably more difficult for us to bring beeswax into the country ourselves we'd probably rather do it through 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 rob and his business um, and let them have the hassle of getting into into the uk when it was when we were within europe in, in the eu and the wax was in in free movement um we were able to buy it from anywhere we liked in Europe quite easily, but it's probably going to be a bit more difficult now. Yeah, so at this moment, where is most of your beeswax coming from? At the moment, we've got a lot of wax in stock, which has come from Cameroons, which we, we bought it from uh, a Spanish merchant um, last year. Um, so a lot of that is, is West African wax. Um, and it's true what Rob said, it, it does tend to be a bit darker and it does have a, tend to have a smoky texture to it and smoky smell, which bees do quite, they do quite, quite like. Um, we, we say we buy a lot from Rob as well, but the majority of our bees, I think, comes in from UK beekeepers in small chunks, this sort of thing. Um, you know, you'll get, you'll get a block like this, which is pretty clean, it's not perfect, but it's ideal and we'll process that. Um, usually through sedimentation and any impurities will drop out into the water that it's floating on. But you have to be careful of this sort of thing. Now this looks like a nice block of wax. Okay, now we took this in at one of the British beekeeping shows a couple of years ago and we thought well, this is a fairly heavy block of wax really. And when we broke it open, <laughs> 
flipping beaky it's got an engineering brick inside it which <laughs> makes it very heavy and you buy wax you buy wax by weight so that was fraud and that was from a, a british beekeeper so you ah. have to be very careful when buying so the lesson there is i mean beeswax has to get rendered into big lumps but then it has to be broken up into smaller lumps so there's no great big yeah bricks secreted inside it Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear oh dear um so if you're buying about 100 tons of beeswax paw is it most of that is leaving you as foundation is that right yeah, most most of it is foundation which goes is is this if people aren't familiar with that um most people i think probably would be um so this is what most of the beeswax goes into um sheets of this um, sort of size and larger and smaller um, and we reinforce it with a, a length of wire uh, to make it stronger when it's when it's in the hive but I would think probably five or six percent of, of our beeswax goes into um, candles and candle making candle makers a lot of candle makers out there want a natural product for their candles rather than using paraffin wax um, so we saw a lot of, uh, of um, beeswax for, for candle makers and, and what about beeswax wraps? Are people buying beeswax for that now too? Yeah, we do. We do. We do sell beeswax for um, beeswax wraps as well. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I think we can open up for uh, questions from everybody now, if we have them. Yes, we have quite a lot and not much time, so I'll just fire away. So first one for Mark is did you find it easy to access credit um, to arrange for the purchases or is was that an issue as well? Uh, it's a bit of an issue because uh, it's egg and chicken situation because the buyer wants to you to have a stock first before they can give you a purchase order. And then the bank wants you to have a purchase order before they can give you credit. <laughs> so it's impossible to merge the two interests. So you have to find credit that is, uh, the only credit you find is very expensive. It's, uh, you, have to, you have to be ingenious, either take from your other business or, or borrow from uh, non-mainstream uh, lenders, which is expensive, mm. yes. And another one for you, Mark. Uh, how many suppliers do you buy from now? Uh, well, I was, maybe I should explain our system. Our system is that yeah. we we buy from farmers. We don't buy from direct farmers. We buy either from farmer groups or honey processors. Uh, like I explained, the, the reason we do that is because it's very difficult to control quality at the farm level because they have different methods of extracting the wax. Some will use a lot of fire and then you have burnt wax. So it's better to buy from people who are processing honey. So it makes it, makes it easier to deal with a few people and therefore control the quality of the wax. So right now we're only dealing with only honey processors and that's a total of 20 honey processors mid middle mid size honey processors okay thanks mark and one more for you is what are the quality requirements that you get asked from buyers uh, one is color uh, the next one is a uh, residue which is not a problem in Uganda. Uh, that is a herbicide residue, which is not a problem for us in Uganda. Mm. And the next is uh, foreign objects in the hand, in the wax. This can be leaves or stones or uh, dead bees. So those are the quality requirements that you must meet. So you have to have a consistent color, it may be bright yellow or a little bit dark yellow, but it has to be consistent to a large extent. You have to have uh, untraceable residue, and you also have to make sure that the honey is clean without foreign objects like leaves and, and branches and, and dead bees. I see. Yes. We've had many questions about pesticides, and I'd like to open up to 
uh, Rob as well and, and, and Paul, anyone really to jump in. What kind of steps can be taken to mitigate those risks? And is it just permethrin that's the problem? Or are there other agrochemicals that risk kind of contaminating um, the wax? I think it's prob probably um, education, really, um, and educating beekeepers on, on, uh, on the use of, of, of chemicals for treating their bees, you know, for, for mainly for brower, um, but obviously for other complaints as well, and try and use more natural um, control methods um, or na naturally occurring acids like uh, use uh, oxalic acid or formic acid for, for controlling um, some of these issues. When you start to use hard chemicals um, like amitraz and what have you, that, that will over a period of time build up. Yeah. So it's um, it's quite a serious issue, but I think a lot of it is, is down to education. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, I think it's um, training and actually understanding the 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 uh, result of uh, your actions. So if if you uh, for example, filter with a mosquito net, then it will dramatically affect the the value of your beeswax. Uh, seeing that cause and effect will will help. Um, one thing that we we're, we're doing is actually providing filter material as well. So not just saying don't don't use a mosquito net to to filter, but here have have some filter material. Uh, we, as well as that, we've also uh, just given a specification, you know, so that they, they can buy locally themselves. Yeah. Mark, did you want to add something? I uh, more of a question, and uh, because if I don't know how you control, I, I would like to know how if how you'd control uh, the, the your next the farm next door from which is growing vegetables and using a lot of herbicides and and yet the plants are feeding the bees i don't know how we'd control that i, I think it's a i think this is a universal problem that needs uh, more than education and and and, and micro controlling this is this is a this is a big problem if it comes mm -hmm. to your area because people have uh, have conflicting enterprises which affect each other mm. yes uh, absolutely there, there isn't really much you can do um to to stop your neighbor from using herbicides it's, it's what you can do and that that would be move your beehives somewhere else um yeah I, I do I do remember um, a few years ago, several years ago now, when, when there was a product called Bayroll came on the market made by Bayer. I think it's still available that um, if you bought that product Bayroll in Germany, there was a label on the box that said not to be used um, in comb honey production because in comb honey production, the customer ultimately eats the beeswax as well as the honey. Mm. So they were aware then that, um, well, I can't remember the chemical that's in Bayroll, they were aware then that it would get into the beeswax. So it's, it's been going on a long time. Okay, and the last question again, this one open, open to all is, what would be your tips for organizing a new supply chain? I guess that depends a lot on what sort of supply chain, but maybe there's some general advice that you can, you can give someone who's approaching this um, task. First of all, see if you can connect with someone who will buy your wax. And uh, there, there, there's a commercial reason for doing it. Mm. Um, and someone who will, who will promise to do it. Um, I think organizing into, into groups and um, accessing education. I know Bees for Development provides wonderful education and training. So um using resources that are available there um yeah that, that would probably be my tips paul mark anything to add 
I think we are, yes, the time is running low. And uh, I just want to thank you all. It's been so interesting to hear all these different perspectives on the wax trade. And um, please do <laughs> leave us some feedback and tell us how this um, webinar, if it was useful, relevant, um, if you were able to connect. And I'll pass on to Nicola to say a final hello and uh, goodbye. Thank you, Giacomo. It's uh, great to see people from all over the world joining us on this Zoom. Um, if you have more questions that you, you want to ask and you want to know more, you're most welcome to get in touch with us. Uh, but it's been really interesting to hear about this wonderful kind of serious scale trade that is underway in beeswax and that beeswax is a, a kind of easier product for, for people to deal with than honey because it's not a food. And it's such a good product because it doesn't really go off if you store it. So poor people can store their beeswax until they have sufficient quantities to sell to somebody like Mark at the beginning of the, the chain trade for this um, fantastic commodity. We must emphasize that beeswax is one of the most natural commodities on the world market. It's uh, the most sustainable, fantastic product and a very, very wonderful way for poor people to create a livelihood. So we really commend all these people that are helping to create the trade for beeswax. And it's lovely to see that it's a strong trade and it seems to be increasing as people uh, realize that African beeswax is actually the pretty much the best beeswax you can get on the world market, the cleanest and best. And as we always say, highly sustainable. So it just remains uh, to me to thank today's guest panelists. Thank you so much, Mark and Rob and Paul for your time and to thank the team here at Beast Development and to thank you for joining us today. We hope you found this useful. We have some more webinars coming up very soon. Um, you can see details in the uh, chat. So we'll say goodbye at this point. Bye-bye. <laughs>